a big welcome to everybody here. My name is Katie Hill. I'm from B-Lab Europe, and I'm really excited to be here today to launch our Interdependence Coalition in this incredibly energetic atmosphere of the B Corp Climate Summit. It's been really fantastic to uh, listen in to some of the sessions this morning. Um, I wonder if many of you have been perhaps uh, logged on most of the day. If you have already, please feel free to grab your lunch while we talk. Uh, I'm not sure if the Dutch and the Germans maybe have already finished theirs and maybe the Italians and French have yet to start theirs, but either way, please make this time work for you while we present our interdependence coalition to you over this lunchtime period. Um, I'm here with wonderful colleagues and partners. Uh, firstly, I'd like to uh, introduce Alberto Alamano, Professor of Law at HEC Paris. He's the founder of The Good Lobby, which supports NGOs and other organizations in amplifying their voice in Brussels. Um, actually, today he's celebrating his 20th anniversary of graduation from the College of Europe, which really went on to define his career in the European agenda. So congratulations to Alberto on this anniversary. Um, I'm also here with my wonderful colleague from our B Corp team in Poland, Wojtek Bajinski. He's the founder of a legal practice in Poland called Bajinski.pro. I think he has more eyes in his name than anyone else I know. <laughs> so a uh, wonderful contributor to our European policy work as well. And you may have already met my colleague, Maria Correa, who leads on all our European communications for the B Corp movement. And he, she also provides impromptu mover and shaker interludes as required. <laughs> So before I turn to them to give you some more insights, I just wanted to share with you this moment, the ambition, the challenge and the rationale and of course the urgency that underpins the uh, foundation of the Interdependence Coalition. Uh, now is the moment. I know you have all heard this before, but we really are at this critical moment. And now is the only moment that we have to redress the crisis we face. We have a huge debt to future generations to be our best selves as supposedly the most advanced species we should take this challenge. And the inequality, the injustice, frankly, the pain, the fear, disease, and the sheer misery that many are going through is the reverse. And uh, Charlotte, you might be able to just bring up the slide on horizon planning. Um, this is something, yes, that just is talking, it's, it's talking a lot, I think, about uh, where we are at the moment. This vision of the three horizons. Horizon one is kind of continue business as usual, don't change too much. Horizon two, but sorry, but bring forward with it what you think is the best of what we have with us in the present moment. Horizon two is really about the innovation towards the vision of a better future. And that's a much more um, experimental phase and much more opening up new pathways that aren't yet clear necessarily, much more brave new world. But horizon three is this vision of the viable future. And that's where we're all trying to aim to get to. And frankly, because we've left things as a species, we've left things so late. Uh, we don't really have the time to go slowly, staying in H1, in Horizon 1, and just adapting. We've got to move fast to H2 and seek out the best options to get us to a vision of a viable future. And to do this, we know that a policy framework for companies that underpins the vision of a viable future is absolutely essential. And that's the interesting and exciting part of this. We really have a massive opportunity in Europe. We were so keen to seize the moment that the European Union opened up as they debated how companies should be governed and managed to ensure that we make the changes we need to meet this existential crisis. The European Union issued a consultation on sustainable corporate governance that was really far reaching and bold. And we're really determined not to let this opportunity drop to bring through the changes that we know are absolutely vital. And we can make these together. So the key elements and the basis of the interdependence coalition is for the EU to mandate at a pan-European level an obligation for all companies to consider the interests of the, those company stakeholders in its business decisions. And that those are aligned with the obligations of investors to consider how their capital will be used to impact society and the environment and that the reporting requirements support these obligations. And that co co uh, combination we see is critical to change the behavior of both management and boards of directors so that we don't have a disconnect different elements of the business cycle and the business contributors. 
and we do know that we're going to get some resistance. There is definitely a, a pressure to manage and stay in horizon one, not to push forward into the unknown, but live and exist off the short term survival mechanisms that have our, our broader humanity really well. But we see from the responses to the EU consultation already that there is a concern that some investors will consider that these interests will reduce competitiveness. And this requires a completely, totally different refocus on the culture of business and on the role and the responsibilities that businesses carry and how they hold themselves and are held accountable, which would be underpinned in this new regulation we seek to see adopted. But how powerful it was this morning to hear earlier how Innocent and Chiesi are actually adapting uh, their own businesses and working in the unknown space of H2, holding themselves accountable to move out of the safe present zone of operations. Um, a theme that's come up in this summit so far is that risk of greenwashing. And one thing that this um, uh, directive that we seek to uh, see from the European Commission would do is embed the legal obligation to consider the environment as a stakeholder. And that would empower businesses to make those difficult decisions on as part of their fiduciary duties. It's almost impossible to ask companies to do this without the legal binding for that. And that is, of course, the gap in which greenwashing can really appear. We also see that actually investments that perform worst are those where companies are poorly governed and where they don't manage the risks that they might face. And there are no bigger risks than those that are created through the climate crisis we're in. And I think everyone uh, is aware, everyone on this call may not be directly in a B Corp, but they're probably connected and understand the B Corp mentality and the B Corp um, philosophy. And they have proved the most fantastic testbed uh, for the concept. We've seen there are 4,000 B Corps all across the world and 650 in Europe who have embedded these concepts that they seek to uh, consider the broader range of interests in their businesses and take decisions on that basis. And they have shown that this is not just good for business, but actually powerful for uh, society and the, uh, and the environment too. So we've provided a fantastic test bed, which we can now show to the European Commission is actually uh, an example in case and can now be rolled out. But we do know that just having this as a voluntary option for certain companies with a sense of duty to adopt is not going to get us even to H2, let alone to H3, to the future we seek in time. So we must actually make sure that we do, as a community of businesses, push for all to be involved in the change we seek. And there is no way that the EU can meet its really ambitious uh, targets through uh, the EU Green Deal to make the, com the continent carbon neutral by 2050 without this kind of underpinning of the legislation. And moreover, there'll be no pressure on other global powers to make these commitments at a mandatory level if the EU, which represents over a third of all world trade, doesn't take this bold step, which it's started to think of making. So this is why we are seizing the moment to launch the Interdependence Coalition to engage you all in pushing for the change we seek. And we're really excited to have you here to uh, understand more about what we're trying to do. So I'm now going to turn to Alberto, who uh, is uh, highly knowledgeable about the internal processes of the European Commission, and to give us a little bit more context about why this is important and what difference this form could make. Over to you, Alberto. Thank you. Thank you, Katie. Hello, hello, everybody. Thank you for, for setting the scene so eloquently in relation to the conversation we want to have today. You have clearly offered uh, a context uh, for the policy option that the B Corp community is advocating for, and you also provided the overall uh, advocacy context uh, surrounding uh, today's political debate. Um, let me take a step back by highlighting uh, the importance of the launch of this coalition. Uh, this is an important moment for the B Corp community across Europe. It's the first time that the fully-fledged campaign has been launched at a pan-European scale, and it is directly targeting decision makers to draw their attention uh, to the big corporation model and also its potential uh, in the future steps uh, of the design of this uh, Copernical revolution, uh, which would be the Green New Deal. Uh, I think the interdependence coalition is the culmination of an advocacy work 
uh, we had the pleasure to craft uh, together with you since the early stages of this policy process that started off with a public consultation, uh, which was launched uh, last October and which uh, saw the participation of a significant number of our 60 B Corps, if I remember correctly, who have been proactively uh, shaping the conversation by taking a stance and being proactive in their approach vis-a-vis uh, -vis the European Union. Uh, this is an important achievement, which we'll also be building upon in the future uh, months and, and years. So this is extremely important. And the overall goal has been to uh, basically increase the visibility uh, of, of the B Corp community, of its model, of its experience, and also increasing literacy uh, around the B Corp's uh, realities across Europe. We, we feel and we sense that way too few uh, policymakers understand that there's so much uh, wisdom and so much know-how uh, within this community that should feed the way in which they're crafting their, their proposal. As you have heard from, from Katie Hill, we, we do this uh, in the launch of this uh, interdependence coalition uh, comes uh, in in a very key moment of the European policy process. Uh, the European Union, uh, since the, the publication of the, uh, public, of the consultation document has been giving us a few hints. Um, the publication of the proposal was foreseen uh, for June. So basically the past month. Uh, it didn't necessarily come, and we also uh, came to know that this has been largely due to some internal uh, debates within the Commission services and some potential conflict uh, in the way in which they approach the different policy options uh, that have been mentioned in, in this document. Uh, this doesn't make this file an outlier, but it certainly highlights the fact that this is the most substantive file uh, as part of this uh, Green New Deal package, in particular when focusing on the sustainable corporate governance, uh, the European Commission is building on the sustainable finance package, which came earlier, and is also struggling to find some sync uh, in between those different uh, files and the different elements that together today seem to be uh, quite fragmented. So there's a, an important moment within the commission, which is unfolding now. And in a way, it's quite positive that the commission didn't rush into adopting uh, the first proposal without necessarily believing it, because the way in which the European Union works uh, foresees the possibility now, once this directive proposal will be published, of having a ping pong uh, between the European Parliament and the Council, meaning all the member states of the Union, 27 governments with very different ideas about this file and involved in many other uh, important policy files within the Green New Deal, but also outside of it. They will be using their power in the near half two years to actually amend uh, this commission proposal. Uh, this does not mean that the proposal will necessarily be watered down or it would be diminished. It could actually be improved uh, from our perspective. Uh, but it's true that at the moment, this file seems more controversial than what we originally thought um, less than a year ago when this public consultation uh, was, was launched. Um, during our advocacy work, and in particular, I would say the pre-advocacy work, the mapping of the overall environment we have realized some potential tensions existing across European countries, but also European communities involved in this space. Uh, we have felt some pushback, uh, in particular in the north of Europe, which was a bit counterintuitive uh, in relation to this, um, let's say, desire to move out of the status quo, and which clearly shows an historical reluctance also of the European Union to push ahead uh, around issues that involve the legal status of corporate governance and more in general for corporate company law. So more difficult than usual is not an easy context, but at the same time, uh, if you think about uh, what is happening around this file, uh, there's, there are a lot of levers of change um, which accompany this transformation, which are putting pressure on the European policymakers. An example comes from the uh, climate litigation, which is really mushrooming across Europe. In which giving, which is giving, if you think about the German constitutional accord, which has been basically holding accountable Germany for not uh, being ambitious enough uh, in relation to the commitment taken with the Paris Agreement. Uh, you see the pressure on government coming also from the outside 
uh, uh, of 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 the work and their own policy cycles. Um, the climate litigation is happening in Germany, is obviously happening in the Netherlands after the Ongenda case. Now you've heard the recent one. We see cases in Belgium, we see cases in Spain, we see cases in Italy, and also pan-European litigation happening before the Court of Justice. Um, I think there's an important connection to be made in our advocacy work and in our overall understanding of the process that governments feel now the pressure to actually act uh, on, on this space. And one way of acting is certainly to create a level playing field, which is currently inexistent uh, for a different way of doing business, conceiving business, running business. And we really believe that some of the policy options which have been initially included uh, by the uh, commission uh, could be extremely useful and could be extremely uh, promising uh, for our community uh, to be advanced, but we probably need to boost some myths uh, because there are a lot of misconceptions uh, uh, around the way in which um, a, a, a mandatory or an explicit, an explicit fiduciary duty could be perceived, could be understood, could be designed, and therefore there's a lot of pedagogical work to be done. And I think each and every of us has a role to play in this in this in this challenge by simply communicating more and better about what we do and what we have experienced. Um, let me uh, conclude by, by saying that um, this proposal certainly will be an important building block of a broader attempt of the European Union to redesign the ecosystem in which companies emerge and operate. But uh, at the moment, uh, we basically have a platform. Uh, and this coalition represents a platform that will enable us to be an active part in that process. So we have also been creating the conditions, I think, for each and every of us to remain informed, first, first of all, about what will happen, and also to be available for action uh, in the future months and years. And this is the nature of this coalition uh, that is, is, it has been launched to, to today. So I would say stay tuned, uh, see what the opportunities are and will be, uh, try to devote some of your bandwidth uh, and perhaps capacity uh, to this battle because it's an important one. In the entire ecosystem in which your company, in which your community will be called upon to play its role in, in, future, in future European society will very much depend on the way in which this proposal will be crafted and will be debated in the next one year and a half uh, or so. Uh, on this note, on this call for action, um, I would like to wish you all the best in this journey. And I'm sure there will be many more opportunities to continue exchanges and remain informed and also uh, changing uh, or sharing our own experience and in particular perceptions of how this proposal uh, will be perceived by our communities. Uh, we really need to shed more light uh, on our different uh, cultural in uh, political context, uh, as uh, Katie mentioned, there's major also cultural resistance, uh, not only legal uh, resistance vis-a-vis -vis those changes. So let's remain aware uh, of those challenges and, and keep sharing. Only collective intelligence can allow us to actually move on on this battle. Thank you again, and back to you, Katie. Thank you, Alberto. That's so, super helpful. And um, uh, yeah, so many elements there. Just to pick up on two, if I may. Uh, one was, I'd just love to get your uh, immediate impression. When you read the consult consultation, I think we read it together, actually. We both kind of looked at it and couldn't quite believe that the, the European Commission was thinking so broadly about uh, this agenda. And um, I suppose what we're wanting to make sure we do is hold on to that, uh, those, those big, broad visions as we get down into the detail. And, and just to get your sense of how we keep that in play in all that we're doing in our advocacy and our lobbying work when the proposal is written. Um, and so that was, that was perhaps just the first question, how we can keep hold of those real essence elements of change that would be represented in that commission document. Yes, this is an excellent point. The, the, the horizon of the possible uh, seemed to be very broad when this uh, call for consultation was published, but since then, we got the feeling after assisting to many events with uh, Commissioner uh, Reinders and, and others uh, speak that probably those horizons have been uh, partly reduced. I think there are many factors that might explain this. A lot has happened in the world since then, and also the COVID pandemic has been drawing a lot of energy 
uh, for, from the European Commission and the Commission services, and also has reduced some of the political appetite that there was initially when we all thought after the summer uh, that we were kind of done uh, with, this, with this pandemic. Uh, in the meantime, we have also witnessed a major increase of corporate lobbying from traditional industries that are basically diminish uh, the space of uh, uh, reality for, for this proposal. Um, we have seen the publication of several reports by Corporate Europe Observatory, but also by Transparency International and the Integrity Work that clearly suggest that the overall uh, rhythm uh, in relation to this proposal has been dictated by a few industries, which are not necessarily representative of, of, of the European business community, uh, but which have been partly hijacking uh, the conversation. So as it is often the case, we've witnessed a bit of an unbalance of, of, of resource mobilization and also attention uh, that has not necessarily been uh, uh, drawn by all fact, by all interest. The public consultation exercise has been a very democratic space where we have seen a, a very important number of uh, voices uh, which have been heard. But we see now a bit of a struggle for the European Commission to make sense of all these different voices and to actually find a possible uh, point of balance uh, in, into this. So let's remain vigilant. Let's remind the commission as uh, the only in institution that can actually initiate uh, the legislative process that all these options were on the table and to rem rem remind them their, their initial ambition and try to counter uh, all those voices that try to diminish or to banalize or to trivialize or even to uh, let's say, to stigmatize uh, some of the options, including the poly option we actually prefer and we would like to push for. Yep, yeah, thank you. Thank you, Albert. A really good reminder of, uh, of the challenge, but that's why we need to be doing this together. It's a coalition and it's a pan-European one with many, many different cultures and uh, agendas at play and lots of different things moving. And in fact, actually, I'm going to turn to Wojtek, who's, I think, done a lot of thinking about how the fiduciary duties might be playing out in different places, but also the cultural elements that underpin that uh, and how we therefore have to work much more broadly than just what we're doing at a legal uh, level. So Wojtek, could you give us a little bit more of your thoughts yeah, on that? Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Katie, for, uh, for um, giving me the microphone. Um, I have some general thoughts and maybe, maybe they will go a bit in the specifics. So I generally think we, mean, we need to make a really swift um, shift in the EU to a stakeholder corporate governance model in which it will be clear that board members must and that are, they are not only merely allowed to consider stakeholders' interests in their decisions in order to meet their fiduciary obligations like a change in the, in the corporate law that would revise these fiduciary duties uh, of all managers in the EU uh, would be a very powerful statement and a cultural North Star uh, for boards of companies, but also for, for employees on what is actually expected from them in the 21st century. So interdependence, care for others, uh, care for other stakeholders, combining profit with a larger social mission. Uh, these are the themes and expectations that are now being loudly voiced by consumers, employees, but also from investors uh, in companies. I think Gordon Gecko is no longer the hero in today's world. But we need to be careful, um, I think, and, th and think in a holistic way. So just mere introduction of uh, piecemeal regulations, I don't think it will do the trick. So shift in regulations, need, it needs to be supplemented with a corporate cultural change and meaningful reporting standards. All of these elements, they need to fit together and uh, as one will, will just not work without the other. So citing Jay Gilbert, uh, co-founder of B-Lab, who I think is uh, today on the call with us, a culture that prioritizes profit maximization will override any stakeholder management systems. But even with a culture of interdependence and a stakeholder management system, a governance structure based on shareholder primacy will not succeed in creating equitable value for stakeholders. This, actually, this thought, it underlines the importance of the fundamental shift that is now being proposed in the EU, and which, unfortunately, is being contested by some. So revised fiduciary duties of boards 
are fundamental and I think underpin all other regulations and visions by the EU uh, within the Green Deal. So foregoing this change in the propo proposed EU regulations will mean that a company by company approach will be necessary to revise these fiduciary duties or we will have to rely on courts to start suddenly interpreting the rules in a way to infer the obligation to include stakeholder interests by the boards in their decision-making processes. Both approaches will not be efficient. And I think it will be too slow to drive meaningful change that we are seeking. A company by company approach involves revision of fundamental corporate documents and most often court registration which for instance, taking the example of Italy may be contested. So the question comes to mind, facing climate change, do we have time for those minor theoretical legal disputes? The EU has really a chance now to expedite the shift uh, to stakeholder governance model through a pan-European regulations. So I, I hope it will use this momentum to drive this change to a more responsible economy. But one reservation, changing corporate law on a pan-European level is very hard. If you agree with, with our cause and with our, with our arguments, uh, and especially if you're a lawyer listening to this, please join us. Let's do this together. I think the EU needs heroes. It needs ambassadors. It needs companies who already live by the stakeholder governance model and these companies should be showing their way to the rest of the crowd and prove that this model is beneficial for the company, the shareholders, the environment, the workers, the local economies. We don't have much time, as you said uh, in your introductory speech, we don't have much time to act and we cannot expect new results suddenly and new improvements by retaining the old methods of, uh, and ways of thinking. And this especially also applies to legal considerations. Back to you, Katie. Thank you. Thank you, Wojtek. Yeah, that was super helpful. And really, um, yeah, at, at the core of all of this is kind of, we have a race against time and we have uh, an entrenched set of uh, expectations and we have a range of different cultures and we have a quite a bureaucratic pr process that we're managing. So there are quite a lot of dimensions that we're trying to kind of fit into this this agenda. Um, and one thing that I think has increasingly been the case is the power of um, society, civil groups. We've seen that beyond any other level, I think, perhaps in the last uh, two years, um, who are putting pressure on what we now ask businesses to think about. So frankly, even if boards of directors, or even if management don't take this on board, there is actually such a pressure now from society. And at the moment, this coalition is actually a business. We are asking businesses to join this coalition. But we do see a future stage where this will be much more about individuals. And I know there's been some fantastic work going on in Spain at the moment around bringing in the public benefit corporation as a legal form. And there it's uh, uh, really the power of the individuals to seek change. So we have lots of different hats. We all where and we need to use them all I think is probably what uh, I, I take from your uh, your message as well yes yes Ex exactly this is not only a, a legal change it's also a cultural change mm -hmm. it needs to happen on a, on a broad level so yeah, um, I, I strongly believe that uh, you know our coalition interdependence coalition will be a driving force in in, in this movement Absolutely. Well, I think now I might turn to Maria, um, who has been uh, masterminding all our um, uh, communications around this. And uh, perhaps, Maria, you could just say a little bit about kind of uh, what we're trying to do and how we're trying to communicate uh, the vision, this H3, this outside uh, the world that we, we know we all want to create, and maybe some of the uh, materials and the platform that you've created to, uh, to, to explain this to everybody that we're doing. So, yeah. Thank you. Yeah, of course, it's my pleasure. Thank you so much, Katie. And thank you to everybody in the room. And we're really exciting, excited to, to officially be launching uh, the Interdependence Coalition today and to share a bit more about what we've put together uh, with everybody. And I think uh, everybody in this room has already been reinforcing uh, two main things. One, that you know, this is uh, an ambitious uh, initiative and it's going to be a challenging and long road. Uh, it also, it's not something that we could do uh, alone. 
It's something that requires everybody to join for forces, strengthen numbers, and we need to be working together with business leaders, academics, policymakers, environmentalists uh, to all come together and drive the systemic change. And so that's kind of at the heart of why we created the Interdependence Coalition, uh, to bring together a coalition of leaders that can work towards this unified purpose of changing the law, ultimately, um, by uh, to truly unleash this, the power of business as a force for good. And from a communication standpoint, we've already been working to build our case, first uh, with the open letter response to the European Commission earlier this year, and then most recently with the launch of our Coffee and Good Company series, um, which have been 30 minute sessions over coffee, uh, which we launched a month and a half ago with business leaders like Beth Thorne from Patagonia, uh, Peter Blom from Triadas, Andrea Illy from Illy Cafe, uh, Christopher Emanuel from Organic Basics, and also friends of the movement like, like Professor Yap Winter, who have all been coming together to unpack what stakeholder means in practical terms. Because I mean, if we're honest, like it is a complicated topic. It's uh, hard to explain all the nuances of it. Alberta was also talking about there's a lot of myths to, to debunk um, in this, this whole thematic. So we've started this series to really hear, hear from leaders of, of how they're doing it in practice and use that in inspira as inspiration for everybody else to, to follow suit. And they've also helped provide tangible evidence um, as we work on the foundations of our argument towards changing the law at a European level because it is crucial for us to, to be informed and, and to have um, a really strong case if we're trying to, to shape policy at this level. Uh, which brings us to the official launch of the Interdependence Coalition today. Um, we're thrilled to, to share our brand new website with you, uh, which is at www.interdependencecoalition.eu. Um, we'll be sharing it on the chat um, and it's filled with resources, with case studies, and most importantly, uh, an invitation on, on different ways for you to take action um, and, and a way for us to aggregate this growing number, uh, this coalition that's growing in numbers to, to, to stay informed and to be available for action as the European Com Commission progresses with their proposal. But rather than kind of pulling up the website and taking you through all of the different pages, um, we've created a short little video about it. Um, so we'd love to share that with you now so you get a bit of a sense of, of what we're trying to do with it, um, and then coming back to talk about different ways that we could take action. So if we can queue up that video. Awesome.
Beautiful. Thank you, Maria. Tell us a little bit about how people can join the coalition and what it will mean in action. Thank you. Yeah, of course. Thank you, Katie. Um, and I hope you all now have that song stuck in your head for the rest of the day. Uh, <laughs> So I just shared the website URL in the in the chat. So it's www.interdependencecoalition.eu. And you might be wondering what it means to join the coalition or what types of action um, you can take. And so um, I think as Alberto put it today, we're kind of growing this group of this network of individuals who can who can get informed and can you know be ready to take action. And there's different things that we're inviting people to do. Um, sign up for the coalition so you're a part of this. A growing network um, to share your own experience as we build a library of case studies on the website you'll be able to see some expert opinions um, quotes and um, while we've already gathered uh, a lot of feedback from the coffee and good company series we will also be unpacking specific quotes um, and and particular learnings from each of those sessions and growing the evidence that we have available there um, for everybody else to learn from you can actually be a guest at one of those sessions if you'd like to share your experience. Um, so there's a call to action for you to sign up if you'd like to join. Um, and I think most importantly, we also have a lot of resources. Um, so uh, like use our resources tab and find out about what's happening at a European level, at a national level, as Katie mentioned, um, highlights that are happening in Spain and across Europe. Um, use those resources to open up conversations uh, with your directors. Be an advocate for stakeholder governance. You can download our uh, call to action booklet um, and, and share the website and share a presentation widely with your stakeholders. And then um, if you are a business leader and, and you'd like to adopt these uh, legal articles and this thinking about um, broader stakeholder governance into the way that you run your business, uh, you can do so if you haven't already um, by checking out uh, our B Corp website for, for relevant country legal requirements. Those are just a few of the ways that you can take action and, and there's plenty more to come um, as this progresses across uh, the European Union. Fantastic, thank you. Thank you so much. That's a, a wonderful explanation and a call to engage with you. We're really finding as we started on this journey that um, uh, everybody's road is really different. Everybody's experience of introducing stakeholder governance or stakeholder management is really different. Uh, the B impact assessment is a really helpful tool to try to um, establish what it actually means in practice to give you some indicators of where to think about what, how you're working and uh, to consider your stakeholders. But you'll hear from the Coffee and Good Company uh, sessions, everybody has taken a different approach and it, it will be trial and error and working it out. But please share your learning because that's the only way we're going to actually uh, build an understanding of what this means in practice. Um, so we're delighted to um, uh, leave you with this call to action. Thank you to the panelists so much for being with us and taking time out of both your day and your nights, I know, uh, to, uh, to work with us to make this happen. Uh, and um, as I say, we'll be back in the autumn. We will expect to receive the proposal when the Commission will adopt, as they call it, adopt the proposal, which will be the basis for the negotiation. So at that point, we do expect there will be uh, um, a considerable amount of regrouping of the coalition members to, uh, to determine how it responds to our our agenda so please stay with us get engaged use the site uh, contact us on the address on the website and uh, and let's let's make it happen thank you so much to you all